Let me preface with a background of my own. You can call me Joe. I served in the army for the last 13 years, all of them in the special operations community. I shoot straight. This post is going to be written bluntly. Honestly, man, after the things I've gone through these past 13 years, I think I've earned that right. Be tracking the fact that OPSEC and PERSEC is still applicable. The simpleton terms, no names, units or locations, and the OP details will be given. I could tell you countless entertaining stories of training exercises, ridiculous happenings during key leader engagements, or minor spooky stuff that had occurred during my time in service. But one operation, one night has not only shook me to my core to this very moment, but made me change my whole perspective on my existence. We were about a week on our latest rotation to our particularly hot valley in Afghanistan with my detachment. Long story short, we get a call that some really bad dudes were held up in a cave system nearby. The other special missions unit with us that had specialized in intelligence advised us that resistance was expected to be heavy. Drone surveillance footage had these guys carrying anything from AKs to RPGs, homemade mortar systems, and even offloaded a DSHK from a truck. Basically a big Soviet machine gun, usually mounted on vehicles that fires a Russian round comparable to a 50 cal. The only thing that stuck out was on top of the fighters pouring into the cave with weapons, ammo, and supplies. The fighters were forcefully bringing local imams from village mosques into the cave with them. They were getting ready for something big with the numbers pouring in, and we were going to make damn sure they never had their moment. Just another Friday for us. We got the green light to get kitted up for an early night raid and piled in the team room like a bunch of NFL players getting padded up for a game. Nothing could be heard except for Doc playing his standard hardcore playlist, Velcro being undone, metallic cobra buckles being set into place, and the distinctive settling of rounds being chambered into weapon systems. The army had blessed us with the best equipment developed in the world. Panoramic night vision with thermal detection, built-in navigation and augmented reality capabilities, sturdy, lightweight, and ridiculously comfortable combat uniforms, lightweight and maneuverable body armor and my personal favorite, the best bang sticks this great nation could buy. My dudes were seasoned, picked from various special operations units, as well as creative individuals from regular units that were just legends in their craft, all in some way putting a piece on the chessboard that is combat. Jim said a prayer for us, as he usually did, grabbed us all by the helmets and put ours to his, and told us all one by one that he loved us. Our own pregame ritual. I found it weird when I first started on the team, but by that night, I welcomed it. We stepped outside. We loaded on our specialized Little Bird helicopters, with a total of 15 men broken into three teams. Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie. Our team, Bravo, was to infiltrate the cave system, eliminate all enemy combatants, and then stand by for Charlie to come in to retrieve intel, those guys being from the previously mentioned intelligence unit. Alpha was to pull security on known cave exits for what we call squirters, individuals that drop gun and run so we can ball them up and hand them over to the spooky three-letter agency guys. I will focus on the five of my team who entered that damn cave. First off is my mentor, friend, and team leader. Context should help further in this story. Jim is a straightforward, soft-spoken officer from Nashville. On first glance, Jim would seem like your standard middle-class American dad. Average height and build, trimmed gray goatee, never spotted without his Tennessee State flag hat, Oakley's, and cargo shorts. Extremely intelligent, graduating top of his class in West Point, Jim could tell you not only everything about U.S. military history, but the history of damn near every culture on God's green earth. And on top of all that, 
Jim is a warrior through and through. On the inside, Jim has the type of heart and attitude that makes you instinctively want to follow every word that he says as well as every action that he does, and fear every sorry individual that crosses him. Next up is Doc, and as the name implies, he was a medic and our newest member of the team. This was his first deployment with us and he had a lot to prove. The fact that he had served as a senior medic in the Rangers for multiple years, as well as enough school time to be a surgeon, didn't cut it for us. We needed to see it firsthand, but so far, he proved to be a medical wizard. He massaged a dude's heart back to life the first mission with him, and I wish I was joking. After that is Phil, our comm specialist, resident surfer dude, fuckboy, I love you man, and soldier I went through selection and assessment with. Right off the bat, we became family. Both single eagles, we got a place together off base, and spent every waking moment together since arrival at the unit that I discuss in the story. For workouts, he's my spotter. Bars, he's my wingman. Range time, he pushed me constantly for perfection. I couldn't ask for a better teammate. And finally is our master breacher, Matt. Okay, so picture the Hulk and just size him down about 1%. This behemoth can find a way in and out of pretty much anything. Doors can be found anywhere when Matt is in the game, and absolutely anything can be opened. This was his last run, his last go at gunfighting until his retirement from the army to go spend time with his kids who were living with their mom in New York. I don't blame them wanting to leave base. I put less blame on his wife for not feeling guilty because of how fast our training and deployment cycle is. The fact is though, Matt loved his family just as much as ours, and he loved the job even more. After each mission that we went on, it was an exhaustion that pressed against his eyes. It was sadness that this chapter was coming to an end. Our infiltrated at a landing zone about 5 kilometers from the cave entrance, put our night vision down from our helmets and our infrared strobes on and began a fast pace to the mouth of the cave. Jim constantly radioed back to the forward operating base updates while Phil communicated with the other teams. We neared the entrance in what seemed like seconds, only to meet a stone wall. No other entrances, no other exits. This threw a major knife in our plan to go in quiet and start stacking up bad guys. We would have to set a minor explosive on the stone wall and make a dynamic entry from there. Pucker factor immediately skyrocketed. Jim motioned Matt to set up a charge and just when he did, he motioned to the ground. Thermals picked up Arabic lettering on the sand dust that was warm. The words translated to ghoul. Taking my red light to it, it was written in a liquid that Doc instantly knew was semi-fresh blood. And to all you guys, you're probably thinking, Hey man, that's some spooky shit. It's not a good idea to go in. But to us, we took it as a warning, that the bad guys inside were taunting us, explaining how bloodthirsty they were to tear into us with their surplus Soviet rifles and machine guns. Mess around and find out and see how it gets when our blood gets pumping. We stacked up and we called up the breach, and then Matt detonated the charge. In a split second, all of our vision was just dust. We filed into the cave flawlessly. Clearing indoor environments is kind of our bread and butter. Scanning targets with infrared lasers and infrared lights, searching for their next target. The dust settled and the team reported everybody was up and safe. And that's when the smell hit us. Almost instantly, I've smelled death more than I wish on anybody. But Jesus. The smell in the mouth of that cave was unlike anything my nose had had the displeasure of sensing. Something terrible. Unholy. We scanned the area and we instantly noticed something peculiar. In the cave were fighting positions dug out, very common for the enemy to do so if they have a stable area to shoot out of the cave from. However, 
All of the fighting positions were faced towards the tunnel of the cave. In all 13 years of fighting bad guys across the globe, I had never seen something like that. The enemy placing their back to us. The fighting positions were filled with weapons, ammo, religious texts, and old footbread. We continued down the cave, anxious to meet the enemy and strike them down with the might of 1,000 suns per usual. As the tunnel continued, it got more and more tight. From a diamond formation, we eventually formed a file, me taking point. And that's when we found the bullet casings. And then the bodies, completely obliterated, similar to injuries you see with low weight explosive suicide bombers. Something was off, we all knew it. We took a tactical pause and Jim said it back to the higher ups, asking all the questions in our heads, making sure they were seeing the feed our helmet cam stream to them in real time. Base responded with one answer. Bravo 6, continue forward. Check. An unsatisfied Phil mockingly responded. About three minutes into the walk, we noticed a door to our left. We stacked and entered. I will never forget the sight. A man, mid-twenties, shackled by neck, eye socket stuffed with ash and missing his left leg just below the knee. Immediately upon entry, the man started screaming. Matt jumped at him, covering his mouth while Doc ripped out a low dose of ketamine and administered it. Meanwhile attaching a tourniquet on his groin to stop the bleeding from his leg. As the muffle soon died down, Jim crouched and gave the man some water while asking in Pashto, Where is the rest of your group? Only death. Jim responded quickly as the man faded out of consciousness. Who did this to you? Where are they? You will die with us. There are no martyrs here. The husk of a man then pointed down the tunnel. Ghoul. That word again. Sometimes the enemy gives nicknames to savage well-known fighters, and that was our best explanation. The man then lost consciousness, and Jim radioed a base. Eagle main, Bravo 6. Go ahead, Bravo 6. Over here. Do we have a persons of interest under the persona, ghoul, over? Negative, Bravo 6. Proceed onwards, over. Roger, Eagle Main. Bravo 6 out. Again, no answers. Again, no choice but to enter the breach. For the first time in ages, I felt something that I lost touch of. Anxiety. In particular, fear. I looked at the always cocky Phil behind the stoic gym. He gave a nervous smile, affirming the fact that he felt the same way that I did. We continued on for what felt like hours, the stench growing stronger with the frequency of spent ammo and bodies. And then, the right passageway opened to the cavern. As soon as I entered, a red light filled the area, like a light switch was flipped in the middle of this cave, carved in a remote area of Afghanistan. Out of instinct, one hand brought my weapon up to my face, the other pushing my night vision up. What we saw in the middle of that cavern, on a pile of staged bodies, forming structure for a hellish throne, the sight of which I fear will never leave me. The only way I could describe it was beastly. Legs of a mule, horns I could see from the back of his head. Skin stretched over almost to the point of tearing in some places, leaking a black smoke. The creature turned its bloody head 180 degrees to us and rose. The team opened up on the monster, and to no effect. And that's when the lights went out. Night vision went down immediately. All that was left was the warm thermal glow of the corpse throne. 
Joe, get us the hell out of here. Pivot and sprint. We hauled our ass back to the entrance of the cave towards the fighting positions. All of us dove to cover, and we waited. Lasers trained in the tunnel. We heard what sounded like goat hooves smashing against the shale. And then nothing. I cracked him. I threw an infrared glow stick down the tunnel. In response, a leg went speeding past my face and hit Matt square in the face, shattering his night vision and cutting his face up and immediately swelling his cheek to a baseball. Hell no. Phil sent a Carl Gustav 84mm recordless rifle down the tunnel. Even with earplugs under my noise cancelling headset, the blast was deafening. I was squeezing off rounds faster than I'd ever had running splits at the range. As the creature came closer, looking like a typical Taliban fighter, minus having what looked like goat legs, we could see our rounds impact, and just as the flesh began to tear, it would attach itself back like a magnet. I was going black on ammo and I knew Phil and Jim were as well. This thing was just walking towards us, eating what would take down a compound of trained foreign jihadists. It stopped in front of us and it said in English, You will not leave this land alive. Shit, maybe not, I responded. I drew my sidearm in defiance as I sent a round right into the forehead of the creature. It dropped like a sack of potatoes. We stood up shocked. Examining the creature, in the distance, we could hear the cavalry of helicopters. Finally, Doc said, still tending to Matt. Me, Jim, and Phil stood over the corpse of the ghoul. Still shocked how explosives and rifle rounds had zero effect on this creature, but my 9 mil hollow point did the trick. Jim grabbed the loaded magazine from Doc and loaded it into his HK-416 rifle, and he fired. Everything went slow motion, simultaneously a radio transmission. Bravo 6, hold your fire. Do not engage. Shit fire once more. A scream. And a lunge. The creature had his hand through the jaw of Jim, into his skull, ripping brain back out in the same motion. I fired again into the creature, and just like before, it fell, with my mentor falling with him. Doc, get Jim! Get him! I had lost countless friends, but seeing a man I had considered a legend greater than Leonidas of Sparta fall, it tears me apart to this day. Doc just looked at me with sorry eyes, while Phil ripped the Tennessee straight flag off of Jim's lifeless arm and put it on my helmet. Phil got on the radio while Doc called in the 9 line a medical evacuation call. Charlie 6, this is Bravo 1. Go ahead, Bravo 1. Cave is clear, move up. Good work, Bravo 1. Come on out. We lifted Jim on a litter and began to move out of the cave, a cheap resting place for a man of such great stature. As we exited that hellish place, Charlie came in, all wearing uniforms that I did not recognize as the same Charlie team that flew in with us, all wearing multicam black camouflage with matching patches. It looked like a circle with three arrows piercing it in a triangle formation. I had served with every special operations unit in the US military. I had no idea who those guys were. We boarded the birds and went back to the Ford operating base. We practically screamed questions, partially out of curiosity, partially out of anger for our fallen leader and big brother. We received nothing except for, it was an anomaly. What you saw is none of your concern. Please sign here for a battle damage assessment and a non-disclosure agreement. I wanted none of it. I flew home to Fort Bragg the following week. Jim to his family in Nashville where he now rests on the riverbank on his family's property. 
His mom looked 20 years older at the funeral. Matt flew to Walter Reed for facial reconstruction surgery and traumatic brain injury treatment extending his contract. While Phil and Doc went back to work per usual, after a few days of leave from the funeral, I instead out processed for retirement from the army. It's been a few months since the incident. I'm living in the city now running off of retirement checks and saved cash. I still miss Jim every day. I check in with Matt, Phil, and Doc when I can. A few contract jobs have been offered with three-letter agencies, one to try out for a mobile task force. We will see how I'm feeling after a few more nights of Tinder swipes and cases of White Claws. I don't think my gunfighting days are over quite yet. I wish that there was more to the story, but there isn't. Evil exists, and it's not just extreme ideals. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you for letting me tell my story. I love you, Jim.